Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me for our training today on hybrid learning. I hope you've enjoyed some of our excellent presentations through the Gulf Forum on Monday and Tuesday. I also hope you're not feeling too daunted by the task ahead. That is implementing a hybrid learning model within your classroom this coming term. For me, this model is enabling us to be part of something huge. This isn't a new policy introduced at your local school level. This is a style of learning that is being rolled out nationwide in the UAE and further across the world. Whether you are a DT teacher, an Islamic studies teacher, an English teacher, whether you have three years of experience or 13 years of experience, parts or all of this are going to be new. They are going to be challenging, but a change in how education is delivered across the globe is also an opportunity for each and every one of us. An opportunity for us to learn new skills, receive new training within our role as educators, and an opportunity to expand what is possible within education. I wonder does, does this anecdote resonate with any of you watching this webinar this morning? It's 2001, I'm 13 years old. I'm in a school in North London. It's lesson three of the day and it's the dreaded mathematics. I'm not in the top set and there's plenty of students who enjoy to misbehave in this class. Not me, of course. Anyway, the teacher introduces the lesson on long division. He poses a complex question. Let's say it's something like uh, 434 divided by 16. He explains that by the end of the unit, we'll be able to answer this question. Across the class, someone shouts out 27.125, a bit like Roald Dahl's Matilda, if any of you are familiar with that book. But the class erupts in laughter. Most in this class look set for a D. There's no way someone has worked this out. The teacher walks over to the student, lifts up his pencil case to reveal a calculator. He proudly picks it up, gives it a wiggle and says, when you leave this school to go and get a job, you won't be carrying a calculator around with you all day, will you? Little did the teacher know that actually we would. In fact, I've got mine here with me right now. It has long been the argument of many academics that the current education curriculums are not preparing our children for the current and future society in which we live. We are in a postmodern digital era where young people are presenting themselves very differently to school than how they did perhaps just 10 years ago. Consider how incredibly computer literate our children now are, many of them more so than their teachers. This generation have had more screen time than their predecessors, and it is likely that this is only going to increase. So here we have an opportunity to change what education looks like not to scrap what many of us have spent decades refining as our own classroom teaching style, but to recognize that our kids do walk around with calculators and Apple watches. They travel to school by electric scooter. They watch YouTube videos for hours and hours on end, and they respond to different stimuli than what the traditional classroom has been capable of giving them. So here we are at a point where, due to the global pandemic, we have an opportunity to deliver something different, a hybrid learning model. My advice to you as educators is to embrace this model, make it your own, change the teacher that you are or have been to meet the needs of the 2020 educator and enjoy the challenging process that is ahead. At this point, I'd like to share a quote from His Highness Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the Minister for Foreign Affairs. He says, in today's fast changing world, educational institutions need to keep up with relevant technological advances in order to be successful in delivering graduates that can thrive in the 21st century. Therefore, teachers need to juggle not only the specific content that students must learn, but also the best tools to be used to ensure learning happens, all the while complying to organizational rules and national standards. So our learning objectives for today, to differentiate between 
different types of learning environments, to identify skills to support a hybrid learning environment, and to discuss communication strategies in different learning environments. Please take a minute to read through the definitions on the screen from face to face on the left through to online on the right. I'll just give you a minute or so to have a read through those. OK, so traditionally learning will take place only in a face to face environment. However, with the onset of technology and increased use of Wi-Fi and its worldwide availability, a variety of options have arose for learning to take place beyond the classic chalk and talk. The online learning spectrum presented here gives a very rough overview of just some of the different stages of the spectrum from face to face through to what we have all delivered over the past few months being an online learning environment. As in the chart, face to face and blended environments are less online and still conform to, to the traditional method of teacher and student being in one space. Hybrid and online, of course, clearly are more online focused. Let's make sure that we're clear on the terms. For example, many people might use the words hybrid and blended interchangeably, but in fact, they mean slightly different things. The difference between hybrid and blended is based primarily on the proportion of face-to-face -face and online sessions and or instructional material in a given course or lesson. Hybrid refers to teaching that is roughly balanced between the two formats. So think 50-50. Whereas blended refers to a mostly traditional face-to-face -face lesson that also incorporates a few class sessions or activities worth of online instruction. Think 25-75. For today's session, we'll be focusing on hybrid learning environments as this is the direction UAE schools are moving towards amongst many other countries across the globe. So what is a hybrid learning model? I like to think about it in terms of a hybrid car. It's a brand new, beautiful, shiny model. It's got a bit of the old school in it as we still fill it up with fuel. It's got a bit of the new school in it as it generates electricity to use less fuel and be better for the environment. It's building towards something more sustainable for our planet and is forward and future thinking. Most hybrid cars have been built in the last decade and have GPS satellite navigation, Bluetooth connectivity and all the latest gadgets. But they also still have a steering wheel and a pedal to brake. The same as cars over 100 years ago had. I would use this comparison when thinking about hybrid learning in the classroom. We're not completely binning your classroom teaching experience. This is still hugely important and the foundations of good teaching. We still need the wheel and the brakes. We're going to utilize some of our flashy new gadgets like Padlets and Kahoot, a bit like Bluetooth and GPS. But overall, this is building a sustainable new education model for the future that harnesses what we know makes good education in schools alongside a developing society that requires further opportunities for students to learn in the digital space and at home. Not just because of the global pandemic, although this has been a catalyst, of course, for its rapid inception in schools, but also for education of the future in general, well beyond COVID-19. Here we have a quick infographic regarding some key differences between the traditional learning environment and the hybrid. Now, not all of these will be true for your traditional setting, but in general, we're looking at finding a sustainable shift in the direction of student centered learning. That is a mixture of the traditional attributes a face to face environment gives us, which of course we don't want to lose, as well as enhancing these with aspects of the online learning process that you have been a major part in over the past few months. For obvious reasons, Currently, it is not possible to have all of our students present physically in the room with us. For many online learning solutions, learners and the teacher are never in the same room at all. With hybrid learning, students get the opportunity for both. 
where half of the class will be physically present with the teacher, whilst the other children are part of the classroom in a digital format. The key here is that the children accessing the learning digitally are still part of the same process of, as those that are present in the space. So as I mentioned, hybrid learning combines face-to-face -face and online teaching into one cohesive experience. Approximately half of the class of students will be in the classroom, socially distanced, of course, while the other half of students will be tuning in online at the same time. In our MOE school context, for example, this could mean that students from one of your classes are divided into groups A and group B. In the first week of term, only group A will attend school with the teacher in person, following the social distancing procedures, and you will teach them face to face as their teacher. However, you will also have a live feed in your classroom so that group B who are at home and will listen and watch your lesson. You will interact with both group A and group B at the same time, even though one of the groups is at home. A lot of planning is needed to ensure that hybrid works well, allowing its two formats to capitalise on each other. We want to offer the opportunity for both the classroom and the online session to cater for each other's strengths. Given the unique opportunities that hybrid learning can offer, planning must be approached carefully. You may have some students who learn from home for the entirety of term one. They could be high risk due to health reasons. They could be special needs students. They may have a new case of COVID-19 in their family or have symptoms of COVID-19 and therefore must isolate at home. Teachers must be able to plan for all these scenarios and create a new set of rules, routines and make an organisational plan for each class of students. I cannot stress this part enough. For many teachers, a plan involves learning objectives, activities and a plenary. However, for this model to be effective for you, you're going to need to expand this planning and consider details that particularly for some highly experienced teachers, may seem like natural things you would do every day that we must go back and really consider within our plans. Establishing clear rules and routines is the golden rule here. This is a new experience for you and the children. So to be, be clear of what they can expect from you as their teacher and also what you expect from them in this new format. Don't be shy to revisit the rules and routines after some time, but of course, give them a chance to work first. A routine will most certainly fail if it is only implemented once or twice. However, over a period of time, you may want to alter, tweak or relax your routines depending on their degree of success. This might include considerations of things like groupings. Will you group students within the same class and students in the online space separately? Would it make sense to buddy them up for some tasks? Which tasks and why? Are you going to behave and manage students in the classroom the same way you previously had done before COVID-19? And are you going to behave and manage students in the online space in the way you have been doing in term three of the online learning last year? How and why? I want to take some time to expand on this point because this is one that has already been asked of me multiple times by teachers. How on earth is it possible to behaviour manage students in this hybrid system? What is the best behaviour management tips and policies? How many warnings do I give to children in the online space compared to the classroom? What consequences should I give out to those in the classroom and those in the online space and how do I follow up on them if they aren't doing them? My answer here is to continue to apply the key principles of teaching and learning within your lessons as you see fit. The same principles of how students learn and stay engaged will still apply. We aren't ripping up Teaching 101 and starting with Teaching 102. 
There is no hybrid behavior management policy that says forget everything you've ever done. And every time a child displays challenging behavior, you should now approach it in this particular way. The same principles apply. And I am a real advocate of not deprofessionalizing teachers by offering advice on behavior management of a class that is not grounded in the context in which you work. You are still the classroom teacher. You are a highly experienced professional and the routines that are most suitable for you in your school with your children, applying the principles of teaching and learning set by the Ministry of Education, those are the best ones. Finally, on this slide, teachers need to be familiar with not just the strengths of online learning and face-to-face -face teaching in their own rights, but also how they can feed into each other over a longer term. Remember, this is a model that is looking to be implemented beyond just COVID-19. Now that we understand what hybrid learning is, let's look at what benefits this model may have. If you can, just post some of your responses in the chat or Q&A area of what benefits you think this model may have for you in your school. Let's just take two to three minutes to post some of these. Thank you to those who've just started to send in some of their comments on the strengths of uh, hybrid learning. Lots of comments regarding uh, a much more student centered approach, um, flexibility within the model, absolutely right. Independence for the students, fantastic. A few questions, uh, a few ideas as well uh, on some some challenges that people had, and we're definitely uh, going to look at some of those in, in a short while. Building confidence again, some self paced for those students that are working in the online environment. Some teachers feel like there may be less uh, behavioral issues in this model for them in their school. Some teachers liking the balance between the face to face and the online learning. Some really, really good, good replies coming in. Lots and lots of interesting things. Some people uh, apprehensive about how they're going to juggle all these things. Some teachers talking about the ease of access to uh, the online resources, uh, the continuous style of learning. More flexible and engaging. Certainly lots of comments on uh, continuing our use and further use of technology in the classroom. OK, thank you everybody for posting those those really, really interesting responses uh, to the benefits of hybrid learning in, in your schools. Um, I just want to take a look at a few more of these uh, in detail. As mentioned previously, hybrid learning combines different modes of learning. Part of it will be face to face. Uh, another part will be online and tasks and assessments can now be online or face to face. So there is no one way to do things in the classroom. This leads to what many of you mentioned in your comments as flexibility for the teacher based on uh, the operational or logistical needs of the school, the needs of the class as a whole, the needs of individual students uh, and the opportunities for the teacher to experiment with different learning strategies, perhaps not previously explored. No students will miss out on learning because hybrid learning caters for students both in and out of the classroom at the same time. It allows students who are unable to travel into the classroom to still access not just the materials, but the whole learning experience. Perhaps in the future, when a child misses school because they're unwell, they will no longer have to necessarily miss out on everything that was taught that day. Generally, face to face allows immediate real time engagement, while online learning allows for independent exploration. Hybrid uses the best of both of these formats. Teachers will refine their skills as they prob as they probably for the first time deliver one lesson to two sets of students in this hybrid learning environment. And finally, parents can continue to be involved by supporting their children at home with distance learning. Now that we've looked at uh, the strengths that you feel and benefits you feel of, of hybrid learning for you as a teacher and, and in specific to your school, 
Um, I'd like you to take a moment to consider what you think the challenges of this system will be in the context of your teaching and your post again some of your ideas in the Q&A or chat. Um, these may be things that we are able to take forward within the professional development unit to continue to support teachers. So if you just could take two to three minutes to consider what challenges you feel this system uh, will give to you um, and just post those in the Q&A for us and we'll take a look. OK, so lots of staff feeling like um, this will be very challenging for them to to juggle um, both teaching face to face and the online at the same time trying to be able to engage all of the students and getting them all to participate, definitely. Um, something that we've touched on already, but absolutely will be a challenge in terms of, of planning. Timing, consistency, younger students are all, uh, an, are all challenges. Poor internet in the school. Difficulty in group work. Lots of comments on, on time, like the live streaming process, technical glitches. Internet access in classrooms, being live on video chat and privacy. Restrictions on the online network. Some challenges from particularly physical subjects. Keeping students engaged, um, behavior management, equal participation, um, having an interactive class. simultaneously addressing the needs of the online students at the same time as the face to face students. Being able to shift your focus as the teacher from the online to the face to face. Lots and lots of, of really interesting comments and certainly things that um, the professional development unit will be looking at um, how we can we can support all teachers with with these challenges. So quite a few teachers mentioning the idea of being computer literate. Of course, uh, as I mentioned at the start, the children are presenting differently to schools now more than ever before, where they're arriving at school with extremely high levels of computer literacy themselves, often far better than the teacher. As educators, we should strive to continually develop ourselves in order to meet the needs of our students. In fact, I read some brilliant articles recently that described the digital gap between those professionals who previously were or weren't computer literate has increased during the pandemic. And therefore, there is an onus on those who are not familiar with online platforms within education to develop themselves outside of their experience with their children in order to ensure that they're keeping up to date with how education has transformed. In terms of investing this time in yourself as a professional, I'll say that this is not uh, something that is going to go away. Uh, it will not be time wasted to invest in improving your computer literacy as a teacher. Time management is another really important skill in the hybrid learning context that should not be underestimated. With fewer students inside the classroom than a traditional face-to-face -face class, hybrid learning makes the time that students and their teachers spend together a much more precious commodity. This real-time face-to-face opportunity to feed back to students on their work, address misconceptions and build and rebuild relationships with students is incredibly important. As such, greater focus should be placed on using what using that time in a purposeful way. With our current hybrid learning environment, time will be of the, of the essence, more so because of the COVID-19 restrictions, where students may not be able to interact with their peers as they would normally and as they would like. Access to collaborate, find and build material and use physical resources in the classroom 
will be limited, not because of the hybrid environment, but because of the COVID-19 virus. Teachers should remember that some activities will now take a little longer as students log in and type to discuss, as opposed to simply speaking out for all activities. Consider that one hybrid learning lesson during the COVID-19 period will take a lot longer to plan than a hybrid lesson in a non-COVID-19 period, as the teacher must consider additional restrictions that will not have to be planned for in the future. Similarly, one hybrid learning lesson generally may take a lot longer to plan than any online or physical classroom environment lesson because of the unusual groupings and time to build those new routines. In a traditional classroom, sometimes a significant amount of in-class time might be spent watching videos or reading texts. In a hybrid environment, teachers should share these videos and long texts for students to read prior to joining the class. And the lesson it itself should focus on analyzing, exploring, deconstructing, and collaborating on the video and texts, for example. This kind of teaching approach is similar to what is called the flipped classroom model, in which students review video lectures and other resources online on their own, who then come to the class ready to go further with what they have covered. But the flipped classroom model is not a totally appropriate comparison for the potential of hybrid teaching. The sessions that are designated for online work in a hybrid class are not merely for reviewing material. They are intentionally much more active. Teachers will need to remember the categories of students in their class. Group A, who are physically present and their needs. Group B, who are following the lesson online, who may have Wi-Fi issues, be less responsive, but will be coming into the classroom in a few days. And Group C, who will remain at home for the remainder of the term. Teachers need to efficiently plan on a weekly basis and lesson by lesson for all three groups. This is where digital copies of the lesson with instructions, activities and notes must be shared with the entire class. Not to forget differentiation and other standard classroom practices must be upheld and continued. Teachers may want to consider recording each lesson as it is, as it is being taught for students to refer back to as well as written notes. With all the shifts taking place, in particular with some students physically present and other students online, communication will be key with students in a COVID-19 period hybrid environment. Audio and sound checks on the streaming device will need to be regularly checked of both students and teachers. This is a good example of one of the routines you might set up that can take some time in your lessons. Teachers should remember that if students from group B and C remain unclear about the lesson uh, or any tasks and objectives, Microsoft Teams should be used to communicate and call students and support them at the end of the school day. Written and verbal skills will need to be a teacher's strength during hybrid learning. Don't be shy to call students or parents outside of the classroom hours to check learning. Again, this is something we would all do regularly within the school setting. So this routine should be continued as best as possible in, the le in this learning model. Remember, some students may feel unorganized and become distressed if they feel that their teacher is unorganized and clear on what is expected. Although this model is new, we should do our best as educators to ensure that students feel like they're able to actively participate in lessons by being mistake tolerant, particularly with communication and IT issues. Patience with students is the name of the game here, and I'm sure we've all built up plenty of those throughout our experience as teachers in the classroom. The clearer your instructions and lesson plan are, the less stress there will be on yourself, students, parents, and school management. Coherent plans that are shared regularly and systematically with all of these groups will help to ensure a smooth transition into this new model. Teachers should not be shy to ask for help and advice 
and support each other with even the most basic organizational tools. As educators, we should support each other as professionals and as colleagues to enable the best opportunities for success with hybrid learning. As it will be difficult to monitor progress of students who are sometimes in the class, sometimes online, and sometimes absent altogether, teachers should keep organized records of who attended which lesson, in what mode, and whether they actively participated or not. Otherwise, it will be difficult to monitor progress and very easy to let students slip away, in particular, if they are learning from home or term. If you feel this is happening, call the student on Teams after school, speak with their parents, and seek help and guidance from your school admin staff and other colleagues. Organising and planning cannot be underestimated in a hybrid learning environment. It is so important to plan well. Over planning for each and every eventuality will pay more dividends than under planning and not having enough activities to keep all groups of students engaged. Many activities may remain possible in a hybrid environment. However, some may need to be reviewed. How would you get students to collaborate with their classmates that are there yet not there? In a normal environment, students would sit together and complete tasks in groups and pairs. Now, the teacher should ensure laptops are brought into school every day, and then they can set up an online environment where students collaborate for each task, whether they are in the physical classroom or at home. They share ideas using online platforms such as Padlet and Nearpod. Try to, tr to troubleshoot your activities before your lesson. What factors may affect the success of this activity within the hybrid model? How can I, as a teacher, alleviate these? Finally, on this slide, it cannot be emphasized enough that teachers must be continuously checking on the welfare of all students during hybrid learning, as some students will find it very difficult to manage the constant changes of being in school and out of school. Many will not have had a structured learning environment around them for many, many months and may struggle to maintain concentration and focus. Consider how you might deal with this on a whole class basis by including learning breaks, fun activities and opportunities for students to collaborate. Consider also how you might deal with this on an individual level. Which students are at the highest risk in your teaching to be lost in this new model or find it difficult to focus? What individual learning strategies might, your, might you plan to give these students the best opportunity of making progress within this new model? A few final points from me, coming back to something I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation regarding opportunity. You are the first generation of teachers to deliver a hybrid education model across state education in this country, and therefore you will determine its success. You are already part of an elite cohort of teachers who are the first to experience one of the biggest systemic changes in education ever seen. See this as an opportunity to be the best educator that you can be. Inspire the next generation of children with your resilience, creativity and problem solving initiatives in a challenging but opportunity filled time. I hope that presentation was useful. If you feel like you aren't fully prepared for hybrid learning, if you're feeling apprehensive or anxious about how it might look, might look then that's completely normal. We haven't had a chance to do a dress rehearsal for this. Unlike other jobs, as educators, we are putting on a new show every day. Our audience, our students, by nature, don't allow us to have a practice first. Instead, instead we learn ourselves from our experiences each time we teach a lesson. Discussing how students feel about this process may be useful, and being honest with students regarding the inception of something new from a teacher's side can often show empathy in attempting to learn in, in attempting to learn a new process for the benefit of your students. I wish you all the best of luck for the new school year and in your endeavours with hybrid learning. Please feel free to contact myself or any of the professional development unit with your questions on this presentation 
but I am go going to now hand over to one of my colleagues, uh, Mr. Carl Radline. So again, welcome to our second part today. We're going to continue talking about some hybrid learning, the roles and responsibilities. So the learning objectives for today are by the end of the session, teachers will be able to identify the teacher and student roles in a hybrid learning environment. They're going to discuss assessment in hybrid learning. We're going to explore online assessment platforms for hybrid learning, and we're going to determine what we can look for when choosing an online assessment platform. Now, um, as we were doing with, with Mark earlier, we're going to do a little bit of a discussion. So you can put these comments into, your, uh, into the chat box, and then we will uh, take a look at them later. Um, basically, we're going to talk about what do you think some of the roles of a teacher in a hybrid class are? And we would like you to think about the following areas. Uh, leadership, assessment, group work, feedback, and differentiation. So just as my colleague did, I'm going to give you a couple seconds and then we'll check some of your answers in the chat box. OK, we said, so we have some answers. I can, I've been getting some from my producer um, about the um, leadership um, and actually um, a lot of responsibility, um, setting up opportunities for collaboration, um, interacting with content. These, these are very good answers. Um, let me get feedback, leadership and differentiation, using technologies, acquiring new skills, facilitator. Yes, that's a very important one, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit also. Thank you very much. Um, a moderator. Yes, very important. Um, creating fair and uh, class time and speaking time opportunities for everyone. That's also very important. Someone said time management, also very important. Group work, innovation, all very, very good answers. Thank you very much for that. Um, let me continue on a little bit. Um, as you can see, some of your answers are here already. Um, some of the roles of the teacher are that they must encourage students and celebrate their successes. Um, an example of this, as some of you mentioned, is working with students one on one during student conference time. Um, the teacher, as someone mentioned before, is like a, a facilitator and a guide, and that's they guide the students in their learning. Um, we've mentioned this in some previous PD sessions, some of you may or may not have, have seen, is that the roles of the teacher in a hybrid learning environment are basically the, the same as in a traditional classroom. The medium has changed, uh, but the basic role of the teacher remains the same. Um, some examples of this that were mentioned also in our chat, thank you very much, are collaborate opportunities for the students using different programs and we've talked about these programs and we will continue to talk about these programs uh, later on. Um, we must instruct content or the foundational skills using um, various methods. That's the, still the key for every classroom, including the hybrid learning classrooms. Um, also, we, can, we as teachers can use programs to provide immediate feedback and scores. Um, a lot of you this week are taking your learning curve tests and um, those tests are graded automatically and the feedback is instantaneous. And the same thing on LMS, you can set up scores and tests like that also. So it's actually very useful and it saves a lot of time um, because you're using both technology um, and traditional classroom activities. Um, there's another way is a good thing is um, someone mentioned communication is using discussion boards or blogs that can be used for group work opportunities. Um, so the teacher would be a moderator in that also. Um, online activities can prepare students for in-class activities and vice versa. Um, we've talked about the flipped model classroom before also. So students can work online in group projects and then they can meet face to face to plan and rehearse their final group present project presentation. Um, now, interacting with content online can pre prepare the students for the in-class discussion. Um, students review the content, the readings, the videos, the audio clips, etc., and then they take an online test before attending the class in which to discuss or debate the topics. Now, online interactions can reinforce or extend those that occur in the classroom, and the opposite is also true. Um, students can provide feedback to each other online and then respond to feedback in face-to-face -face sessions or students finish a discussion online that was started in the class. Now, 
teachers are able to assign various resources to use for learning material in blended learning environment, uh, both traditional activities and online activities. Now, teachers must personalize this material. Teachers can tailor levels. I know Mark was speaking about differentiation also. So the teachers can tailor the levels for each student based on their needs. And this environment in particular, there's the ability to have students using some resources online and others using different resources um, online also, which is really nice. Um, ongoing assessments can also be made um, and teachers have more freedom to assist students through the entire process, giving them feedback along the way. And they have a flexible environment that allows them to make changes as needed, provide frequent feedback um, with, with small assessments also. Um, okay, moving on, um, we've already talked about some of the roles of the uh, teacher in hybrid learning, and I just went on for, I don't know, about five minutes talking about that. But there are also, of course, the roles of the student in hybrid learning. And the same thing, what I'd like you to do um, is to look at the following areas. They are, of course, responsibility, collaboration, communication, research. Take a couple seconds, put your answers into the chat box, and we'll continue in just a second. Hi, yes, I see I see some of the questions, the answers coming through here. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I see there's active learners, differentiate method, methods to, um, to differentiate. Also, the method is very important. Um, the classroom size, that's also a very important point also for smooth management. Uh, participation, yes, active participation, that's a very important uh, part also. I think it's um, in some of the previous PD sessions, there was a, something called the, the wheel of names, where you put the names of your uh, students on a wheel and then you click it and it randomly spins around and comes up with the student's name. I think that's good because it keeps the students on their toes knowing they could be asked um, at any time to contribute to the class. And like Mark said earlier, you know, like if the students are not responding in the class, or you've tried several times, um, you can talk to your principal, you can talk to the uh, social worker at your school, and they can contact the parents, uh, contact the students directly even uh, to get them to, to know that they, they're, it's been realized that they are not uh, participating and that participation is vital for them also. Um, let me see. I'm just checking some of the questions. Differentiation, yes. Uh, research, yes. We will give the, our email address. I'll give it at the end of the um, end of the class. And I think Mark mentioned he doesn't mind giving his email address also. So we will do that also. Uh, Self-paced study. I see student roles. Yes, very good. All very good points here. You guys are, are on the ball today. Students to communicate effectively using critical thinking is also very important. Participation and collaboration. Um, there's a question, maybe Mark, you might know this. Uh, will PE be taught online or how will it be utilized as teachers this term? Uh, maybe Mark, if you want to answer that maybe later, if that's okay. Um, but okay, let me just continue on with the, um, the slide just for a second. Okay, so you all had very good uh, answers and thank you very much for your participation. Um, let me just look at the next slide here and the role of the student. <laughs> You can see it's very small and concise compared to your answers, but um, the role of the student basically, as some of you mentioned, it must take more responsibility for learning. Um, as someone mentioned previously, we are facilitators, so we can help the students by providing an orientation to the technology required uh, in the course. Now, thankfully, uh, last term, uh, hopefully was like some of the growing pains of the students has been um, mitigated. So the students now realize how to uh, participate and how to get online and use the platforms uh, more clearly. So that's always um, always good. Um, it's also good, good for this tell the students where to go for additional support. They can talk to the IT people in the school or they can contact service desk or they can look at videos online, etc. to try to get some additional support to learn how to do it. Um, they must also discuss time management strategies and communicate expected time on task for online learning activities. Um, provide structure for the online activities uh, for discussions. Assign students to respond to certain posts um, or like I was mentioning earlier, use the wheel of name strategy um, or for peer feedback, provide guidelines or a rubric. And this is a very good idea also is to uh, to start with a low stakes assignment. So the assignment, obviously, at the beginning, the learning curve should be 
starting at a lower than getting progressively higher as we go on, not vice versa. So start with a low stakes assignment to familiarize the students with what is expected. And then after that, then they can continue on from that way. Um, reflecting and goal setting are ways that students can own their data. Um, for part two, uh, prepare the students to be become collaborators and communicators. Um, to work with team building activities that allow students to get to know each other, uh, set expectations and make work plans. Uh, for example, the groups can create their own processes and procedures for when or if they encounter group problems. So for example, if they can't communicate together um, on, on Microsoft Teams or whatever, maybe they can set up a WhatsApp group or a Telegram group so they have a backup plan just in case. Um, Teachers can use virtual breakout rooms uh, or boards that can be used for collaborative opportunities. Um, now on Microsoft Teams, you can set up different channels, for example, and you can assign um, group one, channel one, group two, channel two, etc. And this could be act as your virtual breakout room where the teacher can enter, uh, check on their uh, work, go to another room, etc. So it's also a very good um, idea to have breakout rooms on Microsoft Teams also. Um, offering students the opportunity to discuss online um, accommodates, accommodates a variety of their needs. Um, also, the last part, students must become creator and researcher. Uh, students have the freedom to explore and create in various ways using both the traditional and online or technology technological activities. Time is allowed for research, leading to more student led learning. So someone mentioned uh, in the chat box critical thinking or independence. So this can be accommodated in this way also. Um, asynchronous um, or not confined by time discussions allow students to think and reflect before responding. So they don't have they're not put on the spot. They have a chance to actually uh, think about the response and an answer that way. Um, online discussions are also documented, so students and instructors can always view, evaluate, and um, build on all the contributions. Um, in our next part, our second part, um, we're going to talk a little bit about assessment with hybrid learning. Um, and creating assessments in hybrid environments. If you look at number one, um, it says they should address some of the following issues teachers face when facilitating instruction, both online and face to face. So um, for the first part here, it says easily accessible. So it's very important when you're doing assessment that it can be downloaded and it's doable online also. So it must be easily accessible. The second uh, part is uh, reducing the amount of time spent grading uh, system grades. So we've talked about the automatic grading that is available, for example, with you on learning curve or in the LMS system. So it cuts down on the grading time for you if you can make like a scorn, they call it a self correcting test basically um, on the LMS system that will help you a lot. Um, also, point three is sampled uh, submissions. So provide time uh, for meaningful feedback. So sampled submissions. So basically they will submit something to you. You get a chance to check it out and then you can provide feedback to them in a timely manner. This fourth point is the data reports. So make it easier to identify the learning gap. So you get the data about their grades, their attendance, uh, participation, etc. So this will help you to fill in and identify some of the learning gaps and the uh, last point is, as we mentioned before, also automatic grading. So this provides real time feedback for the user in automatic grading. It's always nice for the student to get that uh, instant gratification when they pass the test right away. They submit it and they get the uh, information back right away. So that's also very, very nice for the for the students. Moving on to the next slide. Um, we can see that also it's continuing with assessment for hybrid learning, and this is again a chance for you to uh, brainstorm a little bit. So in the chat box, I would like you to please look at these questions and try to answer some of the questions and we will talk to talk about them uh, later on. So the first question you are to consider is how many platforms should I use in order to be successful? OK, also. Uh, what should I look for in a platform that will create more time for me as a facilitator? 
Uh, we call this working smart, not hard. Um, and also the last question is, which platforms will make it easier for students to adjust to a hybrid learning environment? So as before, please put your comments in the chat box and um, I will take a look at some of them and we'll talk about them in just a second. So please go ahead and do that now. OK, thank you very much. I, I can see that there's uh, less is more, which is very uh, a very good point. And that's actually one of the, the titles of our slides, less is more. Um, so that's very good point also. So not as many platforms, uh, one or two. And I, we'll talk about the reasons for that, but I'm sure you understand why it, it lets these students become familiar uh, with some. Some people are saying LMS, Kahoot, quizzes, very good, Mentimeter. Uh, one or not more than two platforms. I would agree. Keep it simple. Um, don't use too many uh, based on the topics demand. Uh, people are saying LMS is the best platform. I, I agree. It's a very nice platform, also, but there are many others also you can use, but well, not many others, obviously. Keep it down to two or three. Um, always stick to one platform during the class. Yes, maybe one or two. I wouldn't say just one, um, but I would say like one or two platforms, just platforms that the students are familiar with. Um, quality, not quantity that matters. That's a very good point also. Um, that's a very, very good point. I always say that myself. Uh, forums and Swift Assess. Um, someone saying it sounds very overwhelming. Can we please see live examples of this being done? And I was just talking to my uh, producer, my very handsome producer earlier, and he was mentioning that that's a very good point, um, that it is overwhelming. And but we were saying that the classrooms are so different and so varied. It's very tough to give just one particular video of a hybrid learning class. But you guys rest assured that this term in all our PD sessions, the bulk of the material is going to be on hybrid learning. So we'll have lots of examples, lots of experiences, uh, lots of practice doing all this. I know it can be overwhelming right now, but this whole term is going to be the PD sessions are pretty much based on hybrid learning and facilitating classes. Um, I would suggest also get going on YouTube, checking out some examples of hybrid classes there. Um, it's also a very good for teachers to be researchers also. So I think it's a good idea to get on um, to get on on YouTube also and check some of the courses also. Um, I see people talking about Class Dojo as the most common platform. That's a very good platform also. It's good for uh, participation marks and behavior marks for the students also. Um, Nearpod is also good. We're going to talk about that later, I believe. Uh, people, one person says we need to reduce the number of platforms we use, build programs for each grade on one solid platform. That way we don't have to reinvent the wheel year after year. We just keep updating and tweaking the material. That's a very good point. Um, like we're going to mention later, less is more. You don't want to have too many particular platforms. And I, I do agree that some platforms are better for specific grades. So that's a very good uh, point also too. Uh, a platform that's not too difficult to navigate. Very good, not both for the teacher and for the students. A uh, platform that familiars um, uh, are familiar with. Someone says, Lamia says, moderator, please include my comments. So Lamia, um, this is a shout out to you. We will include your comments. Don't worry. Um, we just that we have, a, I've got like 919 published comments right now. So obviously I can't go through all of them, but don't worry. Your input is valuable and we, we value everything. We've got all this material here saved, so don't worry. We can see what you're talking about, so don't worry. Just because we don't get to it during the class doesn't necessarily mean that we don't see or value your comments, so thank you very much. Um, Quizlet is also very good. Uh, of course, the, the students should actively participate research as we mentioned the last term also so thank you very much for all your comments also uh, one or two platforms not too much um, some someone's asking about the attendance link uh, don't worry that will be given later on don't worry we'll, we will not forget the attendance link thank you very much yeah so everyone thank you very much for all your comments you guys are really uh, really good someone mentioned students today get bored with one platform we need to have changes needed i agree with that but not too many platforms Two or three, I think, is, is a good idea. As a previous uh, person mentioned also, we don't want to have too many platforms because, um, you know, the students will will have trouble familiarizing themselves with all of that stuff. So we got to make sure that we, um, we don't use too many of the platforms also. OK, so thank you very much for, for all your comments. Um, let me just continue um, a little bit here, but please, people also, 
you can see these comments that are published. So please, you know, you can copy and paste them and put them into your uh, a Microsoft Word document for your future reference. There are many, many, many good ideas that I can't go into right now because, as I said, we've, right now we have 950 published comments, so it's impossible to go through all of them in the time that we have right now. But it's a good idea for you to go through them. Um, there's lots of good platform suggestions that are mentioned here by your, your fellow educators, so please make sure that you use this resource because this is what it's all about, is collaborating with each other to make the school year and the school experience for the students better. So thank you very much. Um, having proper IT assistance is needed for the students. That's also very important also. I mentioned that earlier also. Um, let me just continue with the PowerPoint that we have. And you know, don't worry, we've got all these comments here. We will um, incorporate these into future training uh, if possible. And for you um, that are listing all the platforms and stuff, thank you very much. You fellow educators, make sure that you copy and paste this into a Microsoft Word document so you don't lose all the valuable information that your fellow teachers are giving you, okay? But I'm just gonna move on for a little bit um, from now. So thank you very much for answering um, all of these questions for, for answering these questions. Um, let's move on for a little bit and we'll get some some more ideas. Um, as mentioned um, earlier by one of you actually and by the person who wrote this uh, PowerPoint also is uh, less is more. So using two or three online platforms makes it easier for students to transition to a hybrid educational environment. And the reasons why are, as you can see, it increases productivity due to familiarity it reduces the user error and it increases engagement also. Now, teachers who familiarize their students with two or three applications maximize the learning and reduce the frustration. We all know how frustrating it can be when we can't get on and uh, access a, um, a site. So it reduces the frustration when you know how to do something like you guys on learning curve. Now you've been doing it for a while. You know how to access, you know how to get on it. Uh, you know, it's little quirks and uh, foibles. So you all know what to do once you're on there. So it's a good idea. Once they become familiar with it, it reduces frustration. Um, also, students can concentrate more on applying their knowledge during an online assessment when they feel comfortable using the platform. It's like taking the LSATs or the SAT tests. Once you know the test that they're going to have, then you know um, you know how to answer them more correctly and with more uh, confidence also. OK. Um, let's look a little bit at some of the online assessment components. So here um, we can see that um, the first part we're going to talk a little bit about is data collection. So um, the key component in selecting the right online assessment platform is figuring out what type of data you want to collect and how do you want to use this data. So we should consider the following when choosing an online assessment platform. Which online assessment tool will provide the most actionable evidence about student performance? Um, does the platform accurately analyze student data to identify the learning gaps? I believe LMS does. Um, I know that the also that the um, learning curve does also. Does the platform deliver data points in real time to use that information to make adjustments on the fly? So um, as mentioned earlier, the instant feedback that teachers get from the tests allows them to make changes um, on the fly or maybe even, for example, include the information that was not comprehended by the students in a review session for the next class. So that's also very useful for the teacher and also for the student. And also the uh, the, the last component um, to think about when selecting online assessment platforms is how quickly is the feedback available to students and what type of data or data does it show? Okay, so that's choosing the direct platform. Uh, next, we're going to look at the components. So some other uh, key factors teachers usually look for when choosing the correct platform, uh, which bit best fits their students' needs are as follows, but they're not limited to randomization. Okay, so like randomizing the, the type of test questions, randomizing the order of the questions perhaps, 
Um, the assessment time limits also. Um, of course, there are the, the rules. Now here, the rules for assessment completion, um, these rules, the teachers may want the option to have their students complete the assessment in one sitting, um, or teachers may also uh, want the option to allow students to take the assessments uh, in chunks by logging it out and completing it later. So that can be a choice that the teacher can make later for the uh, for the students. Uh, proctoring. Now, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, assessment software developers have included this feature to appeal to certain scenarios where students need to be supervised to ensure credibility. So um, please just make sure uh, that if, if, the, if you are going to proctor their, the assessment and stuff, uh, make sure that the students know that they're going to be uh, observed. They know that they're going to be on camera and make sure, like someone was mentioning um, earlier about recording the sessions. Recording is okay. Get the permission of your principal and make sure that the students know that they are going to be recorded, okay? Um, so that's, uh, that's one of the most important things there also, okay? Um, for the next part, we're going to take a look a little bit at assessment platforms. Um, so people were talking about some assessment platforms that um, people would like to consider. And these um, are were mentioned by some people. Nearpod, Mentimeter was also mentioned, ProProfs and quizzes. So uh, quizzes, we'll start with quizzes. It's the, as you can see, online quizzes that can be taken simultaneously or as a game or assigned as homework, which is also good. Uh, for pro profs, it allows you to build assessments online, access a question bank and organize student quizzes individually so they can see which assessments have been completed. Uh, Mentimeter, which is one that we use quite often, is uh, one that allows you to build presentations and to also uh, incorporate formative assessments, polls, and quizzes for instant feedback. Okay. Um, and also, finally, is Nearpod. So Nearpod um, is is good one, I find, because it, it boosts participation um, with collaborative activities and formative assessment as, um, assessments like virtual reality, uh, polls, uh, collaborative boards, and game-based quizzes. So I think that's also a very important part also. Okay. Um, so the overall goal when about online assessment components is um, when considering a particular platform that best suits your classroom, uh, think about the classroom goals that you've set for the year. OK, um, we should analyze each platform by using it yourself first, it's like a, a dry run, a trial run and uh, putting yourself in the place of one of your students. So uh, first of all, like walking a mile in their shoes first before you actually give them the assessment themselves also. Um, very important also is to do a, a SWOT analysis. Uh, so the strengths, uh, what are the weaknesses, uh, what are the opportunities, and what are the threats uh, of analysis of which platforms will best provide an enriching experience and support the curriculum that you are delivering. So that's uh, to talk about the strengths and the weaknesses of something, the pros and the cons is also, I think, a very, very good idea. Um, also, uh, life, you know, it's like a roller coaster. So be prepared to have some ups and downs during the process, um, especially in the beginning. Like I mentioned earlier, it's good to have a, a trial run of everything. Uh, start with low stakes, uh, low stakes assessment first, and then you can gradually ramp up how much uh, each assessment is worth. OK, um, so make sure that that's Part of the process is getting them to um, to start slowly and then build from there. Um, you know, part of success is learning from mistakes and improving upon them, right? So it's very important to to start slowly and to improve upon them, right? Um, the only way you fail is if you give up, of course. Um, so it's very important to to make sure that you realize that not only you are going to have ups and downs, but the students are going to have ups and downs also. Um, so start this year with the end goal in mind. OK, so 
please remember these uh, these parts of the um, of the learning assignment, the online assessment components also. Um, that's the end of our session, but I know that we have a lot of uh, questions and stuff. Um, I have some questions uh, or comments. Nearpod and LMS are the best. I think they're very, very, very good. Okay. Um, yep. So, and so uh, Mark and I are both here uh, right now, and we're available to answer um, any questions that you have. We'll do our best uh, to try. Someone has asked if we can share this presentation with us. I believe this presentation is being recorded. Um, I may, I believe it is. I can see the little red dot up in a circle. So usually if the presentation is recorded, uh, they will put it up on YouTube afterwards. Um, but um, if you send me your, um, if you send me your, your, um, what I'll do actually is I'll give you my uh, email address uh, later, okay? And then what we can do is um, you can contact me and I will try to share the presentation with you. But I'm pretty sure like if a presenter or a, or a producer could confirm that this will be available online later, um, I think it will be available online later, but uh, I'll have to double check. Usually it's on YouTube. Um, let's see. Is there another sign in sheet? I think I'm not sure about the attendance, but the attendance I believe will be shared today. Um, we have we had several messages about that also, so um, we will be giving the attendance uh, shoot sheet soon, so please don't worry uh, that will be that will be coming also, so please don't worry about that also. Um, now someone says, I strongly think that it would be very beneficial and helpful for all of us if you could deliver us a five minute model hybrid MOE lesson incorporating both online tools and the whiteboard behind you. Yep, that's a great idea. Um, we like I mentioned earlier, we are going to uh, we are definitely going to be talking a lot about hybrid learning in the PD sessions this term. Um, you know, right now I'm honestly I'm not prepared to give a, a five minute lesson on uh, hybrid learning right now. Sorry, I've just got a lot of stuff going on and my, uh, in my day today, but there will be definitely will be opportunities for us to view examples of hybrid learning teaching in the classroom. And as I mentioned before, you know, please feel free to um, yes, please feel free to um, to try to uh, go onto YouTube and to try to. Um, to familiarize yourself with some of the techniques of some of the teachers overseas, because I've been checking out the hybrid videos of teachers in class also, and I'm I think it'd be very beneficial to do that on YouTube is a great resource to see what should happen in a classroom in a hybrid class and obviously what shouldn't happen because you get good examples and bad examples both on there also. OK, yes, yeah, someone says we want to see concrete demonstration of hybrid learning. Yeah, me too. But don't worry, we will we will get to that later. Uh, this is like just its introduction to hybrid learning, but we will during the PD sessions give you concrete examples of hybrid learning. And as I mentioned before, please make sure that you uh, check out YouTube and other sources for seeing examples of hybrid learning classes. OK. Yes, thank you very much. Attendance link. Uh, Someone says, why do the walls in the classroom have to be stripped bare? Bear, B-E-A-R. But anyway, so yeah, bare. So anyway, so so I'm not sure uh, about that question. Sorry. Um, OK. The power, yes, yeah, share the PowerPoint itself. Yes, uh, Sally, thank you for your question. Sally, um, I will give you my I will give you I will give my email address at the end, OK, and then um, we can we can try to share the PowerPoint itself afterwards. If that's not possible, then what will happen is this video will probably be made available um, afterwards um, on on the YouTube channel also. OK. Let's see some other questions. Uh, ba ba ba. Yes, there, I know that lots of people are asking for the demo class of hybrid lessons. I, I hear you. I hear you. Um, so don't worry. We, we will try to accommodate that um, at some point in the future. Uh, we're not a, we're not a, available to do it right now, I don't believe, but we will try to do it at some point in the future for sure. Let's, I mean, if I if you don't mind, I'll just jump I, in I, on I, that, I, that I, question. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. 
Um, I've, I've seen a, a lot of comments, uh, people asking uh, for demonstration lessons and, and how, how this is, is going to look. Um, I absolutely uh, and we absolutely understand the need for uh, teachers to want to see a concrete example uh, of, a, of, a, of a lesson for them. Um, this is, as, as Carl said, something that we are, are working towards and, and this is a, the start of a journey uh, of, of hybrid learning. Um, so the end of that journey, what that might look like is, you know, this lovely outstanding lesson. But the start of this journey is going to be understanding the foundations and the principles behind what a hybrid lesson looks like. As I mentioned in my presentation, um, the teaching and learning principles that you know and have experience in as teachers, they are no different. So what you can expect to see in the hybrid lesson should bring together that the online learning that you've looked at, as well as your experience in the face to face, um, as opposed to something perhaps that you might expect that is something completely different. As I mentioned, we're not looking to to completely bin what we've done uh, as teachers for the last 15 to 20 years for some of us, uh, but actually just to to change, slightly change and alter and tweak the way and the medium uh, in which we're delivering that. Do remember, of course, that uh, I'm just looking at the comments at the moment that we do have um, almost 2000 comments have, have come through today that uh, you can only imagine how many teachers there are uh, watching watching this webinar right now on today um, and to to effectively communicate and give an offer um, a sample lesson uh, within for, for all of that many teachers uh, is extremely challenging and difficult and uh, however we do take take your um, your feedback on board and it will be something that we will try to look to do um, as soon as possible as soon as we have children back in school it's something that we will go out as a professional development unit and explore um, however do understand that, that will come and does come uh, with its own context so any example that you might find online yourself uh, or any on, uh, example that would be given um, by uh, by any member of staff that you might see will have its own embedded entrenched context in terms of uh, a particular class, a particular lesson, a particular gender, a particular school, particular facilities, um, which then would make it immediately uh, uh, not applicable for other teachers. Um, so please do understand that this is a, an introduction to a very, very, very large audience of teachers. And what my final advice would be personally on this question uh, is to go and get stuck in. To don't be shy on that first day uh, that you may not have seen specifically exactly what you think uh, a hybrid learning lesson looks like, but you are experienced professional teachers. Get stuck in there and have a go. Um, really don't be afraid to do that and don't feel like you really, really need to see, um, you know, a five minute lesson uh, to, to exactly show you specifically what that would look like with 30 students. You already have that experience with the Ministry of Education. You wouldn't be here if you didn't. Uh, and we believe that you are able to deliver this model effectively. Um, so my advice is uh, don't be shy. Uh, don't be Go get stuck on first day and then go and feed back to your, your school management team, feed back to us in the professional development unit, and we will uh, come and try to, to develop and help you as best yeah, as good. possible. Um, so yeah, good point, Mark. The main advice. thing is, yeah, don't, don't be shy. Like, it's like jumping into the cold water. You got you to gotta do it at first time, right? Uh, but yeah, and there's no, there's no right or wrong way, per se. You know, there's there's different techniques, different teachers of different personalities and different styles. It's just a matter of like just trying what works best right now. Like basically Mark and I were doing like a kind of a hybrid lesson now, basically, you know, like we've got people in, in the class in the classroom now and we've got video components also going on right now, too. So, you know, like we're, we're trying to do uh, like a type of hybrid lesson. Of course, we would have like videos and we would have like Mentimeter set up for us to do that also. Here we have the chat box, which is is part of the hybrid lesson, part of course communication and collaboration. And as Mark mentioned, we've had over 1200 uh, comments and uh, and if you're if you get that many from your students, you'll be really lucky. And of course, you'll be really busy also um, just to some people have been asking for the um, for the PowerPoints and stuff like that. Um, I was just informed by our beautiful moderator, uh, uh, Jean, that this is being recorded and it will be uploaded onto SharePoint. 
So please, if you if you need to watch this again, um, then please feel free. It will be uploaded to SharePoint just to confirm that with you also. So it will be uploaded um, in the future also. And I see a lot of you in the comments box. We're still putting down some great um, ideas and suggestions. So I would highly recommend for you uh, to go through the, the comment box as I'm going through it right now. And you know, like if you're not familiar with something, try to try to uh, you know make a copy of it and put it into the um, and put it into like a Microsoft Word document so you can check it out later. Um, now, some one question is here: Do students in face-to-face -face learning bring their laptop? Activities would be common for both. Yes, I think that Mark mentioned that in his. Um, presentation also it's a good habit to get into when the students always have their laptop with them face to face even if they're in a classroom face to face with the teacher then yes they because there are going to be as you mentioned in your comment there are going to be some activities that are both face to face and online and if the student is in the classroom and he doesn't have his laptop he's not going to be able to participate which is kind of weird because he's actually in the classroom so they they should bring their laptop for the face to face session also um, um, just a, a, a really interesting question here um, says, how can we control parent feedback towards hybrid learning? Uh, because of course, as teachers, we're, we're, new, to, we're new to this. So um, I would encourage you in, in, in the sense of, of looking at parent feedback is, is not to look to control it, but to welcome it. Um, certainly uh, look to be as transparent uh, as possible. Uh, I know that myself and, and Carl have spoken a lot about communication today and the importance of, of that in terms of the hybrid learning model. But of course, uh, expanding and extending that communication to the parents is going to be vital and being as transparent with the parents. I, I mentioned this word earlier on about empathy, about um, being honest with students, being honest with parents. Uh, that they are aware that we're implementing a, a new hybrid model, a new hybrid style of learning uh, for the benefit of their children. And if they do have any feedback, be it good feedback or negative feedback, that you do as an educator, you would like to hear that uh, so that you can, uh, of course, continue to do more of the things that the, the students or the parents have found uh, really interesting or engaging and look to improve on the things that they, they feel haven't worked. Now, those things that haven't worked, so in terms of if there is negative uh, uh, feedback from parents. Of course, some of that will be uh, localized to your your subject, uh, you as a teacher, you to your school, uh, and that is going to be looking at um, how you can respond to that feedback effectively. How can you respond to that feedback within uh, your singular lesson? How you can respond to that feedback perhaps as a school? So how does that feedback reflect um, other teachers within the school of what, what they're seeing in, in their lessons also. So that would be, be part of the reflective process within your school. And then further afield from that, we'll be looking at, um, does that reflect what parents uh, feel with, within the region? Um, so within that, that region, be it Dubai, be it Abu Dhabi, be it, be it Rasa Khaimah, uh, is that what parents are feeling towards um, lots of the, the teaching in there? Now, if we can identify some of those patterns in that feedback, that will enable us again uh, to further help uh, with the training of staff. So what I would say on that is, is be careful not to try to control that parent feedback and, and guide it. Actually try to welcome it uh, as best you can so that we can really understand how the parents feel about this. Um, I know that I've had a, a conversation uh, with, with, with many parents about this, this model um, and they are excited about it. They, they do feel it is uh, the right process that we're, we're going down. They do feel like um, it is absolutely needed uh, for the, the current um, climate in which we, we are uh, and they really do appreciate that this is something new to teachers. They're fully aware that within their own roles and their own jobs, they're also being asked to, to come out of their comfort zone. Uh, so please feel free again to, to, uh, to seek that empathy from parents and, and be honest and transparent with them in terms of uh, the fact that this is something new. Don't hide behind the fact that it is not. It is something new and that we are trying to facilitate our very best um, so that we can get the best outcomes for, for the students in schools. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Again, very good points. I, I just want to read just one comment also here. Um, it's from Anonymous, Mr. Anonymous or Mrs. Anonymous. It says, according to the instructions I got from my principal, we are not allowed to leave our desk in class, right on the board, nor approach any student. Students must stay in their individual desks and any group or pair work is not allowed. We will be teaching them in class exactly the way we teach those staying at home. Can someone elaborate, please? 
Yes, um, this is completely up to your principles. So they, the principal, are the king and queen of their particular domain. So if they want you to teach a specific way, then that's the way you teach it. In terms of group work and pair work, it's still possible, but just not physically possible. Even if you've got students in the class, like they can do group work or pair work together, but it'll have to be online. Uh, group work or pair work also and I think for as it comes to writing on the board and stuff hopefully you'll have like a, a smart board in your classroom or like a, a projector or something so you can sit at your desk and you can still type away at your desk putting things up on the screen behind you or projecting it on the screen so it may be that you're not able to stand up and use the whiteboard and write stuff down physically but you should be able to at least project something up on the board so that all the students can see it in the classroom and also online also so the principals are the bosses the line managers they decide how things are going to be taught in the school they decide if it's going to be hybrid learning if it's going to be face-to-face -face learning because each emirate has different rates of covid infection and therefore different uh, different rules and, and uh, different uh, regulations are put in place for these areas. It's the same in Canada. Some are opening face to face instruction. Some are like on uh, hybrid learning. It depends on the location and the area and the rate of infection too. So thank you very much for your question. Um, I think that even if the students are in the classroom, they've got to make sure they bring their computers. If they are uh, not able, to, of course, they shouldn't be standing up and getting close to each other only because of social distancing, wearing masks, etc. So they, all the collaboration is going to be done online, pair work, group work, etc. So thank you very much for your question. Uh, there's um, a, a question here, Carl, uh, yep. about um, challenge for younger students, particularly uh, kindergarten cycle one, uh, as well as students who receive individual support, uh, both from uh, from parents, from learning support assistants, um, particularly when they're in school. Now, um, again, this is this is part of the of the process of this uh, of understanding and experience with this model. But it is highly likely, remember, that these particular students, if they do need um, uh, additional support to access uh, the learning, that it is likely that they will be part um, of a specific group. So that may mean that they will be part of specifically group A because it means that they will be able to be face to face with the teacher and it means that you'll be able to give them that face to face support if that is what that student specifically needs. For other students, it might mean that they need the, the help of their parent or carer at home uh, to be able to help them uh, even access the, the laptop, etc. Um, so again, it's likely that they would be put in a specific group, perhaps group B or group C, um, where they'll be able to receive that support from uh, an additional adult uh, away from the teacher at home. So if you are looking at uh, or concerned about um, uh, specific students in your class, uh, that is something that you should uh, speak to your school admin about, about how you're going to, to group those students and which group those students are going to be in, um, of whether it would be best to have them face to face or best to have them at home uh, within the first term. That's a very, so, very good uh, point. Yeah, that's a good question and a good point also. Yeah, so we've got to make sure that the students who are actually in group A, B or C in the classroom or at home, or maybe some people or some students are at home and they may not have support. Uh, they may be there with like a, a caregiver or something and they the caregiver can't give them support that they need to get on the internet and stuff so we got to make sure that the students are are grouped appropriately in the groups according to their level of uh internet ability or or if they do require some special uh special hands-on attention there too so thanks very much mark um yes some people are saying school wi-fi and internet connections are not always reliable that's true, but that's that's true in every every country of the world. Basically, uh, we just do the best we can with it. Um, if that's a, it's a good way, for example, if they cannot get online to the Microsoft Teams or something, for example, maybe the students can have a WhatsApp group that they can communicate with each other. That way, we we talked about that earlier, having like a backup plan. Um, Someone has mentioned everyone loves Nearpod, but it hasn't been approved by the MOE. Should we still use it? Um, that's a good question. I'm not really sure the answer to that one, but I will make a note of it and I will get back to you about that also. Unless anyone knows the answer to that, Mark or David, you know the answer to that one? No, okay, no problem. So I'll make, I'll make a note of that and we will discuss that at a later point. So thank you very much for your, um, for your question. It's, it's anonymous, 
uh, anonymous. Um, I did put my email address down here on the chat box. So if you could please send me an email uh, about that and I will make sure that uh, I get back to you about that um, when I do find out the answer to that, okay? Um, there's a question here, Carl, it says, um, how am I supposed to manage a team session and a classroom session at the same time? A team session is already chaos um, and it doesn't have enough tools for the teacher to take control of the session. So again, uh, if you do feel like uh, already you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, a little bit like this is a, a daunting task, a, you are absolutely not alone. There are lots and lots of, of teachers and educators that feel like this is something new and something that there uh, is going to be very, very challenging for them. If you do feel like you have um, continuous uh, issues with behaviour and lessons that you are unable to deal with yourself, then of course you should go and seek support um, from the school admin uh, within your school and within your region. Um, however, uh, as specifically with some uh, for for some support here. Um, we spoke about myself and Carl, uh, the importance of, of setting expectations and rules and routines with the children from the start. Now, you will obviously have set these uh, last year with the students, last term with the students, but remember that um, the start of this year is now an opportunity for a fresh start. Uh, so anything that did happen last year to try to uh, try to give a fresh start to those students, a fresh start to this new training model, uh, and hopefully to try to set out uh, your expectations as a teacher, um, the expectations that the students can have of you as their teacher, um, so that you can try to get um, your, the best outcomes for the students. Remember, uh, when you do go to teach these students, be it next week, uh, there is going to only be one opportunity for you to have a, a first impression uh, with them of this year or a first impression of this new hybrid model. So I would encourage you to go into it, like I said, roll up your sleeves, get stuck in, uh, do as best you can, go in with that positive attitude to really try to address those issues of, of why you feel like uh, you weren't able to, to control, be it behaviour um, or, or engagement of the students uh, within your, your team sessions. Um, again, if it's something that is prolonged and you really feel like you need additional support, absolutely that's the point that you go and seek uh, support from your, your school admin. But um, but thank yeah, you for that. It's a very good, very good question, a very good point also. Uh, just one quick question. Uh, will we be able to use the classroom whiteboards in our teaching? Again, that's up to the principal. So make sure you communicate with your principal to see and to make sure uh, if you are able to use the whiteboards in our teaching. As for me, as long as you maintain social distancing, the students, I wouldn't invite the students up to the whiteboard, obviously, because then they're going to be handling the same markers and using the same erasers and stuff, and that's not clean, and we shouldn't do that. So if it's only you using the classroom whiteboard in the teaching, um, as long as there's some way for the camera on your um, on your computer to capture this, uh, then that's fine. If not, then you can just use the smart board in the class. You can plug your computer into the smart board and then it will be, um, you'll be able to use uh, that way. But if I wouldn't use the classroom whiteboard in your classroom if the students are going to be using the smart board also because you, you'd have to clean the markers in between use and clean the way and it's just not it's not a good idea in terms of social distancing that we're trying to do. So maybe the teacher can use the whiteboard if it's only the teacher and he, he's a safe distance away from the students and stuff. But again, talk to the principal about this. Um, maybe inch, uh, maybe you can, if you do want to use the whiteboard, tell the principal that you will be following uh, social distancing rules and that it will only be you using the whiteboard. You're not going to invite the students up to use the whiteboard in the class. Just make sure that you always double check with your principal or the vice principal of your school. Um, just want to uh, read out one comment here, uh, Carl, from uh, Miss Antoinette de Bruin uh, at Said Bin Jubair School. Um, she says, many thanks, it was a very active and wonderful webinar. Uh, she says, in our school, we have a test run on the hybrid learning classes with teachers acting as students. So this is a, a really great example of, of colleagues within a particular school um, supporting each other to, to really roll up their sleeves, get stuck in, have a go um, and, and problem solve and look at um, building an experience within hybrid learning themselves. Of course, when you do it uh, with your 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 own school and within your own school, you will be able to identify and troubleshoot some of the issues 
local and relative to you, be it issues with uh, the Wi-Fi, be it issues with the laptop, be it issues with the microphones, that you'll be able to sort all those things out between you as, as professionals and, and colleagues. So um, a really great comment there and uh, good to see that, that teachers are supporting their yeah. colleagues. Uh, within and that's like you said, Mark, that's great. Like especially within the school is key because as we know, each school has a different environment, uh, different Wi-Fi capabilities, different behavioral issues, etc. Uh, so it's a very good idea and I think it's a good way for the teachers to share their best practices also so they can they can sh then like when when I was a lead teacher you were a lead teacher we do the uh, the classroom the, the the assessment of the teachers so we go into the classroom we see them do a class and we point out good points and bad points things that need to be worked on and stuff too so I think that's a great way in the classrooms for the teachers to actually uh, to help each other and to see what actually works and what doesn't work and especially putting the teachers in the place of the students because it's very important to remember to see things from both sides to put yourself in their shoes um, because the students aren't going to put themselves in your shoes so we got to put ourselves in their shoes so we can actually find out uh, what is going on um, and how it feels to be a student in the classroom so thanks also for your question there um, uh, there's another question here that says uh are we really just going to, to forget about PE? Uh, after the high BMI results reported last year, uh, are we just leaving this subject out of the equation? Um, so, of course, um, physical education is, is my background and uh, this is something that's that's really important to me. Um, this is a subject that has been forgotten. However, in the, the, the current the current climate, the current um, pandemic that we are in, of course, the, the health and safety of, of, of the students and of the staff in the school uh, is number one. Um, so, for physical education, it, it may be con continued that we are able to support students with, with getting active at home. Um, so again, just a big thank you uh, to those who supported the Stay Home Sports Day that we did during the uh, during the pandemic. It was a, a really great success and I would love to see uh, a continued legacy of, um, of support for that project uh, going forwards of, of how both um, students and families are getting active outside of outside of school. Um, however, um, this is something that is high on the agenda. Uh, please, uh, PE teachers and PE staff, stand by for uh, further updates on on how physical education will be uh, supported and and uh, and taught in schools this term. So please uh, wait for uh, announcements on that. Um, but of course, as I mentioned, the the most important thing at the moment and the highest consideration uh, in in terms of teaching physical education is uh, is unfortunately. Uh, during the pandemic, the, the the health and safety of all of the students and, and all of the staff. Um, however, uh, I know that lots and lots of PE staff have set up some brilliant uh, online resources, created their own uh, YouTube channels, Instagram channels, etc., for the children to continuously get active at home. And I'll, I would uh, I would really encourage you to continue with that. There was some amazing, amazing work going on uh, in physical education last term uh, to try to um, really help with the, the health and well-being of our students and their families at home. Um, so again, stand by for, for further details on that. Um, but uh, absolutely, it has it has not been forgotten. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good point too because uh, one of the main it's very important for the kids not just in the UAE but all over the world to try and stay active um, as much as they can because it helps both physically and mentally also. Um, also people are talking about and the questions Mark about the uh, learning examples and stuff don't forget on, on learning curve there's a there's a, um, a course right now uh, introduction to hybrid learning and I think that it will answer some of the questions that you may have also that are in the comment box. And also, if you check out on Learning Curve, the Safe Return to Schools, um, there's also there's one of the Powtoons uh, that we used in that is based on um, the classroom management systems also. So basically it tells life inside the classroom and we talked about hybrid learning and we talked about different resources you can use also there too. So make sure that you check out the resources on Learning Curve too. Um, some of you have been saying that you're having problems get accessing Learning Curve. That's just a, a volume issue. If you can't get on it, um, for example, just maybe first of all is to uh, refresh the uh, refresh and take out all the cookies and to uh, what's that called clear the data and the caches and all that sort of stuff and then you can get you should be able to get on the learning curve also also be patient try it again a couple of times like uh, like sometimes you can't get on because it's just overloaded but just keep trying and eventually you'll be able to get onto learning curve um, that's just one of the things that we have to deal with in an online environment is sometimes the um, 
sometimes the internet just doesn't cooperate. You know, who is it that said technology is great when it works, but it doesn't always work. So that's the thing we have to make sure that we try to have some backup plans for that also. But yeah, I, I, I agree, Mark, that the PE is super, super important also. And I remember last term we had some uh, virtual PE sessions and those were very, very, very well received. And I know a lot of the students that I spoke with uh, really, really appreciated having it to give them something to do. Um, so yeah, I hope that continues. I'm sure this will that will continue this term also. So I think that's a very, very good point. Um, okay. There's a, a question here that says, um, are we to have separate lesson plans for students at home uh, and the ones in the the real classroom space? So um, no, your 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 plan should be a, a hybrid plan, but it should be one plan. So the actual learn objectives, success criteria that the the students will complete for a particular lesson should be the same. So it should be one. Um, however, uh, the the mode and medium that that's taught is obviously across two two modes and two mediums. Um, but it will be the same. It should be one plan. Now, of course, uh, there's a different aspect to that plan. There is a, a second thing to consider in terms of how you might uh, do the regular teaching and learning aspect of, of a lesson. So how you're going to question the students might be different and will have more detailed planning in it because you're going to look at questioning students who are face to face set, sit in front of you whilst some students are, are tuning in online. However, in terms of the question of one plan, it should be less than one plan. Um, that there should be still one plan, but just further detail on how you're going to go about um, meeting the teach and learn and requirements for that particular lesson. Bearing in mind, you've got some children at home and some children within the classroom, but absolutely it should be one plan. OK, um, so I have some questions about whether whether the ministry will pay for the Nearpod. I'm not sure about that, but I will. I will find out about that also. Um, it's someone says the issue with Nearpod is the fact that teachers take the copyrighted Aleph material in their resources. Um, let me see. I was saved. Okay, good. Let me see. Um, yes, I think someone said good example was to get every student to join Microsoft Teams class and then group work to be done differentiating through the channels. Yes, that's. As I mentioned earlier, that's a great way. It's like we call it a breakout room or something like that. So it's also very, very good, um, a good idea to do. Um, now, someone says in face to face, there are some situations when a teacher needs to interfere directly and do individual discussions. How can this be done here or an alternative strategy, especially that not all students, mainly those that need help, will not be observed? Yeah, that's a very good question. So you can't, I mean, in face to face, like if the principal allows it, if you keep a distance, your safe social distance, then you can maybe talk to the talk to the student um, after the class, perhaps, or in a less crowded environment. Um, maybe that could be done. You could have like a, a meeting with the student, not necessarily in the classroom, but you could go outside of the classroom to have a discussion with him or her. Um, maybe just main, make, making sure that you maintain the social distancing and also having the um, having the mask and stuff on. So just maybe it's possible, but you might have to be um, might have to maintain the social distancing. Uh, it can be done outside of class, perhaps if you need to do a quick um, a quick intervention. Um, let me see. In case someone's saying we're not able to open Padlet or Nearpod activities within the school premises, um, how are we going to overcome this issue? Again, I am going to talk about Nearpad later on. As I mentioned, I put my email address already on the uh, Q&A event, so I will get back to people. I've already had people asking me for information. I will get back to you as soon as I find out the information myself. Yes, again, people saying they want a, a, an example lesson of hybrid learning, uh, but don't worry, we are thinking about that also. Uh, good, giving a chance, good, yeah, so I think someone mentioned the point about giving more chances to shy students and, and raising their confidence. I think that's good, um, a good it's a very good idea to do. Um, and I think most, I mean, I, I'm sure the internet and using hybrid learning is very good for shy students anyway, because they can, you know, participate uh, virtually and they don't have to stand up in class and raise their voice or anything like that. So I think it's, it is a good opportunity for shy students um, to raise their confidence levels for sure, for sure. 
Um, there's a question, uh, Carl, about yep. how we can uh, use pair and group work on online. Um, so I'm sure I'm sure many of you have experience now in the online domain um, in uh, arranging students to um, to do group and pair work in the uh, when you are working with them on, on Microsoft Teams. Um, this is is using pair work within this hybrid model is, is very similar. Um, and as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, you're going to look at depending on the lesson, depending on the age group of the children, depending on their experience of, of being able to, to do pair and group work um, is going to depend on whether you want to pair up students in the class and pair up students in the online domain uh, who are tuning in separately or depending on uh, the specific task, it might be appropriate to pair up a student and this is why it's so important for that they bring in their laptops um, student within the classroom with a student uh, online. Um, but again, there is no hard and fast rule to this. It totally depends on um, on the activity you're doing and of the students that are that that you have. Um, but certainly, I think mixing up uh, the opportunities to do that pair pair and group work, be it um, the children in front of you and the children at home and trying to, to mix that interaction. Um, will, will, is, is the best way going forward. But again, like anything, this is a new model and you're going to have to to teach and train the kids in in those things. I mean, uh, as you as you will all know, that the very first time you might have asked uh, some children to do some pair work or do some feedback work, um, they didn't have the most amazing, incredible uh, answer for you. And you as teachers have built um, that amazing ability for them to be able to, to do the pair work and do the feedback. And that's taken a, a, a process. So that process now will need to, to happen again uh, with this model where children need to, to understand your expectations of when you do put them into paired work um, in the hybrid model, what your expectation of them of them back is. So certainly having different options for them to, to do pair and group work is, is something that this model offers that uh, other muscle models up to now haven't. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Um, I've been asked to try to share um, some information for some teachers um, regarding the uh, classroom changes for for the year. So what I'm going to it's it's the Powtoon session that is on uh, that is on learning curve right now, but some people haven't been able to access it. So I'm I'm going to try to uh, show this uh, for you guys now, as I've been requested to do so several times by people. So let me just try to uh, include this now, and hopefully this will be able to be seen by by everybody. Um, is it okay, Dave? Can I play it? Explore successful tips to handle the classroom changes in the upcoming academic term. As teachers and students return to school, classrooms will look and feel differently. The way students engage, their reliance on technology, and the organization of information and resources are just a few areas that need to be addressed in order to provide students with an enriching educational experience. A few of the classroom changes you can expect to encounter are classroom environment changing to a blended style of face-to-face -face and online, routine and protocol for blended learning, organization of virtual and classroom environments, addressing possible achievement gaps, and a heavy reliance on a blended digital learning resource system. No matter how each school implements school rotations to address student capacity, one thing is true. Blended learning will be relied on heavily going forward to address the changes in classroom instruction and organization to help students be successful in this academic year. Knowing how to tweak your delivery and set up in distance learning to fit the blended style is your key to success. Let's take a look at some tips to help you and your students this year. With blended learning, less is more. Students can feel overwhelmed while adjusting to blended learning. So, Keeping online resources in one platform will increase the amount of time students spend transitioning between apps. Use the tabs to incorporate websites and resources used frequently. Also, organize class files by week and day to make it easier for students to access materials. This will also make it easier to identify learning gaps. Also, to ensure success in your routine, 
adjust your classroom routines to incorporate sanitation and safety practices. Allow students to feel safe and free to express themselves. So as you can see from the videos, they're just giving uh, this is like how to adjust for the class routine and stuff. So in many instances, you are going to be responsible for the, the sanitization of your classroom and stuff. So it's just helping to um, you to get ready for the uh, transition in the ability to transition for your um, for your classrooms with the um, with the sanitization routines and everything too. Here are five tips for your blended classroom this term. Make all materials available in a digital format. We rely heavily on students doing work digitally to reduce the spread of germs. Utilize educational platforms which can be accessed offline. Okay, so that's a very key point also, is about making sure that the uh, videos can be accessed offline also. So um, everything is very important to be, like because a lot of people in the comments have mentioned that um, there is poor internet sometimes or lack of internet sometimes. So try to use the resources that can be used offline as well as online also. Pre-record your lessons and make it available online, along with supporting videos to help students master each lesson. Okay, so again here, what's up? What's oh, up? Uh, okay, yep. So basically, pre-recording your lessons and making it available online with supporting videos to help students master each lesson objective would be a good idea also. Um, because, you know, some students may not even make it, the, be able to make it to the class. Uh, they may be absent. Um, so, and also it serves as a good record for you to be able to have um, these videos to help your students master each of the lesson objectives. Objective. Make project-based learning a part of instruction. Encourage problem-solving skills outside of the classroom. In a distance learning environment, sometimes students may not have access to the internet or the internet may be quite slow. So, what can you do to address this issue without a delay in delivering the curriculum? Utilize resources that have both online and offline capabilities. For access to books, use Aldi One. If students have access to a mobile device or tablet, they So again, uh, Aldi One, uh, very important. It's one of the ministry websites, of course. So the mobile device, they can download the books using the All D1 site. So very important. They can download their books using All D1. The Microsoft Office Suite has online and offline functionalities. These allow students to collaborate whether they are in a classroom or at home. As videos have become increasingly popular, explain everything offer students a chance to demonstrate their thinking while creating short video clips. And again, this allows for the students to be creative, um, gives them a chance to uh, to demonstrate their knowledge and in, for people talking about the shy, uh, the shy students, for example, it gives them a chance to uh, to they, their knowledge in a non threatening form, not in front of the whole class or anything like that. While in a virtual space, we have less control over physiological and security needs, what we can do is provide a sense of love and belonging to thoughtfully engaging our students. When students feel safe, they are ready to connect, which is part of the emotional state of the brain. Let's take a look at a few tips. Have students greet each other by name. Greetings can be a great way to start your meeting on a positive or even a silly note. For elementary students, try the rainbow greeting in which the group waves their arm like a rainbow arc while saying hello to each person. Or an animal greeting in which you choose an animal for kids to mimic while they say hello to each other. Acknowledge the students who could not participate in the virtual meeting. This piece is critical for promoting a sense of well-being. Use share prompts to get students to open up. Consider topics that all students can relate to, such as asking to share a favorite book, movie, or activity. 
simple props allow students to express themselves Okay, thanks. So that was just a quick uh, video. It's available on the learning curve access also. So if you want to check it out, then please feel free to do so. I uh, will continue answering a couple questions here. Um, there's a question here from um, Lamia. It says, is there a risk that as a teacher, you develop bonds with the students you interact with in the class uh, and not with the others online? Um, so remember that uh, for Group A and Group B uh, students, um, they will be swapping. Um, so some will obviously be in the in the classroom for a few days and then there will be the online students uh, a few days afterwards. So it should be fairly shared um, uh, and the opportunity to build and rebuild relationships um, with those students um, relatively easily because they will be in and out of your classroom. What may be uh, a little more difficult is those, those students who are in uh, Group C, as we spoke about earlier, and there may be students who do have to work from home um, for the, the entirety of the term. Now, uh, building these relationships with students, as you know, as teachers, is, is incredibly important uh, to, be, to be able to support them, uh, to be able to, um, for them to be as successful as possible. Um, so if you do feel that there is a risk with those particular Group C students, that might be something that you consider in terms of your planning. So what activity might you do exclusively with the, uh, the Group C students or how might you question the Group C students slightly differently whilst the Group A and Group B students are, are on a task so that you enable yourself to, to build and rebuild those relationships. Remember that part of the, the planning process now, I mentioned about that it is going to be a little bit more in depth a little bit more complex uh, and perhaps move away from this idea of just planning some learning objectives activities in a plenary and that part of that learning process is going to be how can I as a teacher build and rebuild these relationships and if group C students uh, are at the highest risk of, of me losing those relationships what do I need to insert into my plan uh, to ensure that I'm that I'm able to do that um, I think it's a really great point uh, certainly something that you should consider um, and again you know your students if you feel like there are some students that will be in group c when you see the group when you make the groups um, that you think are that high risk ensure that you you really do deal with them so thank you for that comment and that question thank you uh, another question is talking about um we did not have access to a lot of the options in teams as teachers will we be made organizers so we can make breakout groups a very good question um would bring that up with your principal um i know that um some of my trainees had the same uh questions last term and when they talked to their principals they were made organizers and then they were able to do many of the options that are available in teams um someone also asked me how do you make channels in teams once you're in your group, like whatever it is, like uh, Abu Dhabi 16 or uh, Fujira 17, whatever the name of your class is, if you look um, on, on the left panel, there'll be three little dots. You click on the three dots and it'll just say create channel. And then that's as simple as that. You can name it whatever you want to name it. And then you can, uh, you know, say group one and you can put make a list of students who are going to be group one then you have channel two which could be group two and you have a list of students who could be put into the um, um who could be put into the uh, group there also so it's it's um it's very good um very it's a very useful tool to have so um please if you are not made an organizer then please talk to your principal and then he or she will try to will make you a, an organizer i'm sure it's not a problem if it is a problem, then maybe the, the principal or whoever is in charge can make channels within your uh, particular page. OK. Let's see. So someone says um, if you are not, if you're not a supervisor, you can make channels. I don't know if that's a typo or not, but if you're not a supervisor, then like I said, talk to your principal and then he or she uh, can either make the channels for you or the he, the he or she can give you the uh, the power, if you will, to make the um, to make the channels yourself. So thank you very much.
So, yes, people are saying that uh, I think we have uh, to acclimatize to hybrid learning. I think that's a very, very valid point also. Um, yes. OK. In our school last year, we were not allowed to make channels. Again, uh, talk to your uh, principal. Uh, maybe he or she will re-examine the, the issue. Um, I personally, I think it's a very useful tool to have for group work and for um, for group work and for pair work also. So um, I, if you just explain to them why you want to make the channels, then perhaps they'll let you do it. But again, that's up to the principal uh, yourself. Like I said last year, I had several people with the same problem. When they talked to their principals, they allowed them to do it or they either would uh, simply make the channels for them themselves. Um, good. Uh, I'm just reading some of the comments here. Um, the names of the presenters, yes. Uh, my name is Carl Radline, and the other presenter's name is Mark Gildy. Just so you know. Okay. Uh, another question. Where is the link? It's it's coming. Don't worry. Um, And let me see, please advocate for improved internet capacity in the schools. Yes, uh, that's a good, a very good point. Don't worry, um, I'm, the principals know that if the internet is bad in their school also, and they're, they're, they're doing all they can to try to upgrade the internet system, not just in the UAE, but all over the world, because the demand is obviously much higher now than it's ever been before. Um, someone is asking students to open their is. Can we ask students to open their cameras if we're meeting them for the first time? Uh, again, I would check with your principal about that first. Um, personally, I prefer to have my camera open and I prefer to have the people who I'm talking to have their camera open also, but I understand there are privacy issues. So please make sure that you check with your principal first before you get them. OK. Uh, someone is asking, how will we manage the SEN students? Will they attend or be exclusively online? Um, again, that's going to be a decision made in conjunction with your principal and with the SEN um, administration. Um, it, it depends on what the nature of their um, of their 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 um, their special needs is. It could be that they need uh, to be in class or it could mean that they need to stay home. So I think that's pretty much it for the day. Um, we're going to wrap up now here again. Uh, my name is Carl and I was working together with Mark today with our fabulous producer David um, and um, and Jean and I, I'm sorry I can't remember the name of the other person. It's, maybe it's Christine, I can't remember, but thank you very much for all uh, your, Vicky maybe, or so thank you very much for uh, uh, everyone, so thank you very much. Um, we are going to. There's no extra work or anything that you have to go to now. So, uh, so thank you very much. Um, I will see some of you today in my cycle two trainers for our TTT meeting today. Uh, for everyone else, please uh, have have yourself a good rest of the week. Um, enjoy the training. Uh, please don't forget to check out the learning curve powtoons and uh, stay safe. Okay, thank you very much.